have a recipe book of my own recipes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A big recipe book. Wow. A fundraiser for an For desserts, for, uh, you know, I can do anything. Desserts, uh, you name it. Wow. Fish, meat, paella, curry. Mm. Cooking is very, very nice. You know it. Yeah, very. And people these days cook less, but it's bad for health. Yeah. Your health, if you cook, instead of buying pre-made food, which is, you know, what many, many people do, if you cook it, it's different. It, yeah, you know, it's more healthy, it feels better in your stomach. And, yeah. and when somebody else cooks it, it makes you feel better. Exactly. <laughs> Even better, yeah. Right, right. Like we do right now. Yes, right. <laughs> it makes us feel very good. <laughs> So we start with a few minutes meditation? Sure. But you know, it is true. When you cook with love and you enjoy it, the food is much better than when people cook and they don't enjoy it. They're just doing it. Yeah, exactly. For the results of having it. it right, is. but it's if you enjoy medicine. cooking and you like, you know, the taste and this and that, and it's very creative. Yes, cook. oh yeah. Very creative oh, thing. Right. And you know, the, the chefs of the world, you know they are they are considered artists yeah, these days. I mean, and in Spain we have very very good cooks. Oh, yeah. There's one here, Jose Andres, I think. Jose Andres is it's a very known, well-known chef in the United States. What's his restaurant? Jose Andres is his name. He has many restaurants. What's that? It's not, it's not uh, George and Andres. Uh, what's, what's, what's I think it's Jose Andres. John George. John George. <coughs> what? He's very popular. He, I've seen him in CNN, so you know it. Uh, <laughs> it must be real news. <laughs> fake news? I've, Is that what you said? Yeah. Fake news. <laughs> well, CNN, I mean in, this, in, the, in the US channels. I don't know if it was CNN, but it was one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. One of the big channels. You know, in Puerto Rico, when there was this uh, hurricane, yeah, he yeah. went there and gave food to people, oh, and he went the shutdown. He organized also for employees free food in all his restaurants and mm. and things of the like. So he was in the news for that. And uh, they say he's one of the most popular chefs in the U.S. That's what. They, they presented him in the TV like that, you know, Jose Andres. What's his first name? Jose Andres. Jose Andres? Mm -hmm. Jose Andres. Maybe we just don't watch the news anymore here. We're, We're too scared. Yeah, Jose Andres restaurants. Let's say. You found him? Yeah. <laughs> Restaurant like that. Is that good? That'll be our Four trip. Four days. Oh, uh, oh, he's in Maryland. That's why he's in Maryland. Ah, right. Okay. Where? 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 Does he say where? Both. In Washington D.C. Oh. He's in Washington. He's in California also. Gee, yeah, he's yeah. not in New York. Virginia York, now. He's yeah. He's, he's D.C. It says D.C. Virginia. You know all the D.C. area. But that's the Maryland Hill. Yeah, all in Maryland. That's a very mm -hmm. expensive area. Anyhow, he's a Spanish chef. Oh, and good. we have very good Spanish chefs. Food in Spain is nice. Yes. And oh, there is a culture of cooking at home. Oh my God. In Spain, it's Spanish. not normal that you buy pre cooked food. Oh, you, yes. you cook at home, which is more healthy. That, that's why we live more. In Spain. <laughs> not true. I mean, uh, um, you know, for example, in the U.S., the average life is much lower than many, many countries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it has to do with the diet. with the diet. Mm -hmm. Sugar. It has, people well, think that has to do with the health system. No, it's yeah, the diet. Right. Yeah. And the lifestyle, it's high stress. Really. And the, yeah, a little bit, probably the lifestyle also is involved, but the diet is very important. Mm. So you're going to publish your cookbook, your recipes? Can eh? You're going to make a cookbook? I, I have not thought about it, but I have it. It's, I have the cookbook with all my recipes. Where? In Spain, I have it. Up here, right? You can do a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fundraiser, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, well, I would have to translate it to, to English first, because it's, it's written, all the recipes are written in Spanish, handwritten. So, you know, I would have to put it in.
type it and you know there are drawings but I do the drawing of how you have to cut this or that. But you know we'll so have I to come visit and watch. <laughs> Take yeah. notes. <laughs> the best way to learn, <laughs> to learn to cook is exactly is by cooking. The one <laughs> TV show. Like meditation. The best way to learn meditation yeah, meditation is by meditating. And cooking. <laughs> meditation and cooking show. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the things that I have thought for the ashram. You know, uh, you know, now they call it mindful eating. No, so mindful cooking and meditation courses. You know, many people would oh, appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. Teach them how to cook, and you teach them how to do the chant, and four or three things here, there, and these are the typical things people like, and you give them mm -hmm. something that is useful for them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like stitching. And that is having an Ayurvedic five-day workshop. Nice cooking. Sip and paint. Okay, let's have a few minutes meditation. <sighs> Slowly. Namaste. So, <clears throat> as we were speaking about, you know, these guru stories. Um, 
I would like to point out one thing which is important to understand. We don't believe in miracles, in this organization. I'm going to put the satsang of Guru Raj so yeah, that you can listen it. Many spiritual books, you know, um, have this thing of the miracle or magical approach to things. Um, and I will, I will tell you a Guru story with Guru Raj. Uh, you know, everybody is always kind of saying, you know, you, you've been trained to expect a miracle for a spirit, from a spiritual teacher. Because you, you've been trained to believe that Jesus would walk over the waters. Forget about it. Nobody walks over the waters. Or you know that he resuscitated dead people. Or no, that, that doesn't exist. That doesn't, doesn't work that way. Nobody levitates. Nobody levitates. You will be able to levitate once you control gravitational energy and you put together something that compensates gravitational energy. But neither you are going to levitate nor you are going to see anyone levitating unless he does a trick and make you think that he is levitating. Many people do tricks. You know, the Sai Baba used to get golden eggs from his mouth or uh, put his hands in a fire and and do things. But, uh, those are tricks you know uh, and, and tricks are things that I believe that there are Benito, creo que hay unas cartas de póker allí en el chitramelas you know, tricks are tricks and I can trick you now in a moment there is, there is a I saw a how do you say a Cards in the in <laughs> okay. So cards, right? So look, <coughs> I'm going to take the first card, I don't know what is the first card. I'm going to take the first card and this card is going to tell me how many piles of cards I'm going to do. So if it's a three, I may make three piles, if it's a six, I will make six piles and so on and so forth. Oh look, a three. A three? Yes, a three. So, now you tell me when do you want me to stop? Just tell me stop. 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 There? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want me to put this there? No. 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 Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Putting them all together. So I do three. One, two, <coughs> three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh my gosh. <laughs> One, two, what? Three. What? It's what? not magic. It's yes, just it a is. trick. <laughs> Did you know the cards? Did you the cards? No, what I'm trying to tell you is, please, don't believe in magic. Because it's very easy. It's very easy to trick the mind. It was not prepared, eh? You know, I, I, I was listening about these, these things that I said, look, I have to speak about that because it is important. Um, there are all three. I remember with Guru Raj, I join you. <laughs> I remember with Guru Raj, uh, um, he, we were in this course in America. It was, I, I believe, it was in California, and we were together in a room. And you know, 
you know, people always wanted to. I can make you more tricks, eh? I could keep you would busy. You tell us how you did it? <laughs> Trying to find out how I do things. Yes. Well, what was amazing all, is we were all so emphatic about you stopping at the and We were all so together on yeah, yeah, stopping. I mean, but that, you create that in the, uh, you know, you, you do that yeah, on you purpose. You create what you want. Right? You count the cards and you know that you are counting 12 and, and then you say, when you want me to stop? And people always oh, say, I now. <laughs> and then you play around, you want me to put this here? I say, no, no. And you put it back and oh, people I always see. answer the same, you know. Oh. So it sticks, it sticks. It's very easy to, to trick the mind. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we were in this course with Guru Raj and, uh, you know, all these people, you know, miracles, miracles, there's many people that they want to see miracles. You know, you want to see a miracle to check that he is it's real. the real stuff. Right. You want to see a miracle. So he said, okay, I'm going to make a miracle for you. So he said, take petals of that flower, it was a yellow flower. And so he took the petals of the flower, he put them in the hand, and he said, now I'm going to give the petals, we were a group, you know, s sitting around, and we had to put the petals in the hands without looking at them in the hands of the next one. And he said, by the time they arrive back to me, they will be white. So, you know, people started to pass the petals and literally by the time they arrived to Guru Raj they were whitish because all the yellow had been left in the hands of the people. <laughs> <laughs> it had lost the yellow through the sweat, you know, and you had to press like this and put it like this and the other one had to do like this, so they were white. So you see a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Which he was trying to teach. Look. You cannot go against the laws of nature, but I will put his words in a satsang explaining the same thing, right? Mm. <coughs> Which is this one. Mm. Divine will. Sorry, the projector, yeah. Yeah, it's not in the So here in this satsang, uh, it's, it's just 10 minutes. Uh, but it's based on the question that someone asks him about doing good deeds. And that you know that the spiritual people, you know, they, they kind of like to do good deeds. And uh, he mixes uh, several things, so he will speak about good deeds also. It's very interesting what he says. Uh, but he's, he starts uh, speaking about divine will. What is the divine will, right? Divine will is a phrase so misunderstood. Divinity does not will anything. It is a common saying that uh, let thy will be done. Now, will in itself implies a thought process. Without thought, you cannot will. And that is more for the human mind rather than the divine mind. So, what do we mean by divine will? It means that within the laws of nature, things has to function in a certain way. It is the law of nature that water will run down the hill and not up the hill. Hmm? It is the law of nature that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. 
So it is the mechanism of the world's functioning. It is the mechanism of the laws of nature, which is will, which is divine will that was not created or premeditated, but it came about as a manifestation. Which means this is basically a teaching that includes all scientists, which is forget about divine will because it is not beyond the laws of nature. That is divine will. All molecules move according to the laws that govern their movement, as any science can tell you. The fact that you don't know all those laws doesn't mean that they can move against what the laws of nature predetermine. So if the laws are of nature are predetermining where your molecules are moving in any given instance, in other words, there will not be a moment that this falls upwards unless I do a trick. I can do a trick and make you think that it falls upwards, but it will be a trick. <laughs> or that I understand the gravitatory field in a way that I have a machine that can compensate that, but I cannot go against the laws of nature. Not even God can go against his own laws. If you plant onions, you would not expect potatoes to grow. <laughs> and yet if you think divine will is so powerful, that can be changed. Hmm? You can plant potato seeds and onions will grow. Hmm? Because we have given so much emphasis and power to divine will, the miraculous power, and yet Divine will does not operate miraculously. That That's another important point. Divine will doesn't need, in fact, to operate miraculously because its own laws make the miracle possible. I'm not sure what divine will is. What would you say your definition of divine will is? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm using Guru Rajas here. Yeah. Here, as you have seen, divine will is the laws of nature, the laws that govern the movement of anything that is manifested. Any atom, any anything is governed by the laws of nature and the moon not knowing how to count doesn't miss a millisecond of the time it has to do going around the earth. It doesn't miss a millisecond. Nor that can be changed. Not even by a miracle. Because miracles don't exist. Do is bound within the laws of nature for what we understand as that supreme will is bound within the laws of nature much emphasis and power to divine will the miraculous power and yet divine will does not operate miraculously that too is bound within the laws of nature for what we understand as that supreme will is only the will of nature and not of God. For that divine essence is beyond all thought. It does not think. It is a neutral energy. And as I would always say, it is like electricity that could be used in a stove to produce heat or in a refrigerator to produce coldness. So, man with good intentions, he would say, I am acting within supreme will, divine will. What he actually means, that I am acting according 
to the laws of nature in accordance with the laws of nature and not against the laws of nature. Hmm? Which means that the only way to define good and evil would be basically that you can go with the laws of nature or against the laws of nature. And part of the laws of nature is evolution. So for example, say, when was the when did women vote in this country? 19, 1920? Okay. In the 1920s, uh, you know when Huh. Come on in. No problem. So in the 1920s, for example, you would have, you know, all sorts of political discussions uh, about women voting. And you would have the people that would oppose to women voting, and you would have the people that would favor women voting. So you could say that now that we know that women vote and that that was the right thing to do and that was the direction of evolution of society in this example, you can say that those that were in favor of women voting were in the were the good ones, were in the right side, were, were going on in favor of what evolution is going to, and the ones that said no, women cannot vote, would be against uh, the laws of nature, because they are not going in the direction of evolution going. It's understood what I said. But it's very important to understand that without the opposing force of those people saying no, the people saying yes would have not been able to do it. So you need both in reality. None is good or bad. You need the interaction of both and that's how things happen. If you go against the laws of nature, you suffer. If you go in favor of laws of nature, you don't suffer. So, but you have the option to go in against the laws of nature. But you cannot avoid the laws of nature. So miracles, I mean, don't exist. Nobody walks in the waters. Have you seen everybody, anybody walking in the water? Well, I can guarantee you, you will die and you will not see it. Unless they make a trick on you. That can also happen. But <laughs> so that will be... So how about with... Sattva, Tamas, Radhas. It's opposing forces. Exactly. Yes. The opposing forces create the movement. Mm. Sattvas and Tamas create the movement, but you need Tamas. You cannot do it without Tamas. You, tamas is as necessary as Sattvas. So I, you need both. It's the yin yang. Nothing, nothing in this universe is, you know, uh, if you think about evil, you would say, well, evil, you know, it's like you have to get it away. Mm -hmm. Nothing is, is, you know, you cannot take up anything away or, or put anything more in this universe. It is, as it is, it's perfect. It's in perfect balance and it's, it's how it is. You, nothing is, uh, nothing is disposable. Everything is necessary. And you need that opposition because that's what mm -hmm. creates the movement. It's, you know, we have day and night and rain and sun and, and uh, like this, everything is like this, no? So let's continue with this. He starts with good intentions. So the man of good intentions, you could say that you are in favor of the laws of nature. You could say that the man of bad intention goes against the laws of nature. But it's not that he is good or bad. It is simply that, you know, you have an opposing force is divine will. Now, individual will comes in when man starts analyzing and weighing the pros and cons of the situation 
happen for the fulfillment and expansion of his own ego. That is, that is part of how the mind works. You receive the event, the event, uh, you know, activates these samskaras, these memories, these information structures. Uh, you give that information to the analysis, analytic part of the brain that evalu evaluates the pros and cons, that gives that information to identity, that then makes a choice to survive. Because the human animal is that little eye. That little eye has the animal instinct of survival and perpetuation. It is constantly looking to survive and to perpetuate itself. And the human animal is the most aggressive and, you know, the brutal animal of all nature. So we call it the little eye, but the ancient people call it, called it the devil. The devil was not an entity, was the little eye. That's the devil that makes you suffer. So we call it the little eye, but in reality is the most brutal animal in nature. And that's why your mind, your little eye, is always trying to survive. The identity has to survive and is always procuring to perpetuate itself. So these two instincts, which are the animal instincts, the basic animal instincts of survival and perpetuation, is what is inherited by the little eye. And the little eye is the human animal. And the human animal is brutal. I mean, just look at the news. I mean, you don't, you will not find an animal that behaves as badly <laughs> as the humans wherever you look in animals. <laughs> individual so when we say thy will be your will comes in when man starts analyzing and weighing the pros and cons of the situation for the fulfillment and expansion of his own ego that is individual so, when we say, thy will be done, we surrender the I-ness that is within us, the me and the mine-ness that we have, that is obliterated, that is forgotten. We become oblivious to it and just flow with the laws of nature, and that is the Supreme Will. <coughs> So. Which means that once you have lost the identification with Ahankara, with that identity of the little eye, that you are permanently wanted to survive and perpetuate, once you discard that as what you are, and you are left with the day you have to live, then you learn how to flow in the day you have to live. And once you start learning how to flow in the day you have to live, you start appreciating the beauty of that experience. And then you become oblivious of the little eye and you just flow with supreme will. And then when you flow with supreme will, things happen by themselves. But it's not a miracle. It means that you are not the doer. The doer, which is the observer, uh, is the divine will. You just let your, you, you just let, you just flow with the divine will. You just flow with the laws of nature, and then you arrive to the place, but not miraculously, unless you want to make a trick and make the other one believe that it is a miracle. Many people do it. I could be doing things like that with, with cards and you know, you know how to do it. You could make things, 
people believe that you are doing miracles when you are not doing any miracle at all. You are just playing with the mind. You have many magicians here in this country, you know, and they really can play very well with the mind. You know, all the, all the mental, mental magic that uses the impressions that are created in you and, and you say, oh, it's magic, you know, no, it's not magic, it's a trick. Yeah, yeah, good intentions can have no power whatsoever as long as it is based upon the needs of the ego. Once the needs of the ego, then it's bolstering up could be eradicated through spiritual practices, then those intentions that started in our little minds merge or manifest as the intentions of the Supreme Mind. This is why I told uh, Anna today, you know, when she was asking me, and when you see something good in a person, uh, do I need to see that good in me? That's bolstering your ego. That's falling in the trap of your ego. You don't need to do that. You need to forget about your little ego. You know, he's built on lies. He's, he's just making you suffer. It's the only thing that is there that makes you suffer. Contemplation, meditation, creative thinking, acting, whatever you have to do as an offering, that doesn't make you suffer. What makes you suffer is the mind chatter that is telling you one untruth after the other, one day after another, since you have memory <laughs> of yourself, which is you have continuous memory of yourself since your teenage years because it is then that you associate your identity with certain memories. That's why if you want to go back to when you were three years old, you don't remember. Four years old, you don't remember. Five, six, seven, few images. But once you arrive to the teenage and you start elaborating your identity, <coughs> you start associating memories with, with your identity and then you have an idea that you are that but it's an, an imagined die, it's not the real eye. What was the, good intentions have no power, I lost that part. Good Indefinite intentions have no power if, if they are there to bolster up your ego. He now puts an example of what he's speaking about. So, and I will put it just a, a few seconds back so that you can listen it again in any case. The needs of the ego, hmm? then it's bolstering up could be eradicated through spiritual practices, then those intentions that started in our little minds merge or manifest as the intentions of the Supreme Mind. Hmm? So then only all our work bears fruit, beneficial fruit, sweet fruit to benefit others. There was an old man who was planting mangoes. Hmm? Now, mango trees take at least about six, seven years to grow and bear fruit. Hmm? So some youngsters were passing by and they tell this old man, um, you are so old, you've got one foot in the grave, you're going to pass away. Hmm? And then why do you plant these trees? Because by the time the tree grows and bears fruit, you will be dead. So he says, I'm not planting for myself. I'm planting for others to enjoy it. Hmm? I'm just doing my work. I still have some strength in my body. And let me use it for the benefit of others. Hmm? Now, that is good intention. Hmm? That is good intention because it is not for his little self. It is not for self. 
degrees selfless for the self of others. You see, that is good intention. So, you are going to do something for Auntie Matilda. <laughs> she's not well, she's ill. So you go down and do the dishes and wash the clothes and this and that. Hmm? There are two reasons why you do that. Hmm? And the one reason is this, that it is because your auntie and she is not well, so as a niece you have to do that duty. You don't feel like doing it. Hmm? You say, oh, right, sure. Hmm? You're doing it for the duty, but the observers from outside would say, Oh, how wonderful little Mary is. Hmm? She helps her auntie so much, yet she hates every moment of it. So that does not bear fruit. Hmm? It does not bear any fruit. Hmm? Fine. Another reason could be... This is important, which is... You know, good intentions, when you force yourself, you want to be good and you say, oh, it is my duty to be good and then I have to do this. But you really don't do it naturally. You're just fooling yourself. You're tricking yourself. It's a little ego that, you know, wants you to feel good. But that's not doing good. When you do good, you are not even aware you are doing it. I give you a rose. And you take the rose, you throw it to the floor, and you stamp the rose. And I feel hurt. I have not given you the rose. The rose is still mine. I was exchanging the rose. People know how to do business. I give you this in exchange of that. So, uh, I give you the rose, and I'm expecting a smile, or a thank you, or a something. And you throw the rose, and stamp the rose, I'm hurt because I'm not giving you anything. In fact, the only way you can give something is without being aware that you are giving. Because if you are aware that you are giving, you are not giving, you are exchanging. Because you are adding value to what you are giving. And then you say, this value against what value? So the only way to give is without being aware that you are giving. The only human experience that gets near to what is giving is, you know, is a mother that, you know, has had his baby and, you know, it's, it's, it's changing his diapers and everything. And she's not counting diapers, <laughs> say, I, I, I changed you five times. <laughs> Show me that. She, it's, it's her joy to do that. She doesn't have the sensation of giving. She, it's, it's, she does it, she's just flowing in her own joy of doing it. That is giving, and you are not even aware that you are giving. And the same thing happens with love. The very moment you say, I love you, you have, you are, you have stopped loving. Love is never aware of itself. It just happens. And the moment that the I gets in the middle, the love disappears. You love nobody. Love exists. You can become love, but you cannot love someone. And when you become love, you, you, you loving becomes your natural way, but you are not, you know, you don't have the idea, oh, I, I love so much the people, <laughs> or anything like that. Ah, oh, let me look after Auntie Matilda, and I know uh, she's got some of them. That's it. <laughs> uh, That's the other possibility. Sure, if I look after her well. Money. Here, I will put it to you again. I'm yes, going to do something for Auntie Matilda. Hmm? She's not well, she's ill. So you go down and do the dishes and wash the clothes and this and that. Hmm? There are two reasons why you do that. Hmm? And the one reason is this, that it is because your auntie and she is not well, so as a niece, 
you have to do that duty. You don't feel like doing it. Hmm? You say, oh, that chore. Hmm? You're doing it for the duty. But the observers from outside will say, oh, how wonderful little Mary is. Hmm? She helps her auntie so much, hmm. yet she hates every moment of it. So that does not bear fruit. Hmm? It does not bear any fruit. Hmm? Fine. Another reason could be, ah, oh, let me look after Auntie Matilda and I know uh, she's got some of that. And I'm sure if I look after her well, you know, she will look after me. In the one instance, it is a total disgust, becomes a chore, becomes a burden to do it. In the other instance, there is selfishness. Hmm? And that could bear no fruit. Hmm? So, outwardly, outwardly it might seem to be good intentions. Hmm? To the observer, it might be so wonderful and good. But, ah, little Mary, is so nice. But yet, it is totally fruitless. So that was it about miracles and being a good person. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting though. Sometimes it's not that direct. Like I think a lot of people, they do good because they want to bring others joy and as a result they feel good. But then they're getting something out of feeling like they're being a good person. Yeah, they do gooders. You know, it, it is not what we teach to right. The do-gooders, it's, you know, the... But is that identified say for example, identity? Say, for example, you know, the, uh, there is one thing in the Bible that says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Uh -huh. Which means, for example, say you want uh, service is one of the things we teach to our students, right. to service others. But without your right hand knowing what your left hand does which means say you you have to find something you like to do that you enjoy doing say you like old people for whatever reason right. you know because You're you are connected because you were connected with your grandfather when he died and you like old people right. so you can always go to the Red Cross and say look I'm going to use 10 hours a week or whatever the case might be for elderly people that are alone and they need some help and some company and this that the other please let me know and uh, you know I, I am going to put this this amount of hours a week good you do that but the moment you publish it in Facebook or you start telling everybody that you are doing it or so on so forth the moment that you let the right hand know what the left hand is doing is useless, completely useless. You are just feeding your ego to not only make you feel good yourself, but so that everybody knows how good you are. Do it, but let nobody know about it. Don't tell it to your friend, don't tell it to anybody. Uh, you know, and you can do this kind of services, you know, you find out that the neighbor is under a bad economical situation and you know that so you go one day and with a white envelope you put five hundred dollars whatever you know because you have that but you don't tell anybody you don't even tell the neighbor it's you that is doing it you just do it and then you will experience what is servicing without expecting nothing in return because if you look at yourself, every time we are going to do a good deed, the little I get in between says, how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then, sure. and then it, it, it's a personal food. So, uh, we finish now with the satsang, and we go back to the blackboard. <laughs> Understand, 
mando. So, um, I can put this out, no? Yes. <laughs> oh, no, Jane. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, it's it's recorded, eh? So, uh, uh, who has had problems? Not everybody of you have joined to the classroom. Only a few of you. You are. You are, you have joined. You have joined also. And you have joined. I joined looking for yesterday morning, but yesterday wasn't taped. Yeah, I, everything was there. Everything was there. Really? Yes, it was. Uh, everything is there in the videos. Maybe it wasn't there. Maybe it was too early. It was there yesterday. I did put it. You know, I will put all the all the classes today. By the way, today, uh, for those that stay here at six, uh, uh, Jeff Carr is going to connect with us. Oh. And we and he's going to give us give us a uh, twenty minutes satsang. Oh. 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 It will be finished by six thirty. Oh. But we are doing that because we are testing technology, you know, as to have a teacher from another place connecting. Nice. So we are trying to see how that works. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because he's doing satsang. We are. Tuesday night. Yeah, he's doing a satsang Tuesday night. Apart from but we are checking technology, so I said, you know I'm going to be with the teachers in New York. He couldn't do it before six because he had a puja in the Ramakrishna temple, da da da, so until three o'clock he didn't finish, which is six o'clock here. So we will do it at six. Okay. Now, um, One of the, I'm going to explain you now a little bit how all these patternings of the mind are created and how are they related exactly to the circumstances in your life. Um, you might have heard, uh, you know that with your thoughts you create your reality. Many people, you know the secret and all these things. And people think in magical terms, you know that like if it was an energy, that, um, that you know, the, but it's very simple and I'm going to explain you and I think you will see it easily how we create our reality with our thoughts uh, and I'm going to put a, a little example of, a, of an instance then I'm going to explain you how all these patterns and all these behaviors uh, come together and you will be able to understand how this all works no, so I'm going to put you this example for the, to begin with. Imagine a young woman. First of all, don't look at me. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, are you going to burst my bubble don't that I don't me. feel energy? Eh? Are you going to burst my bubble that I don't feel energy on the Camino? What burst your bubble? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I'm going to explain you. You know how how this works. <laughs> Now, uh, the mind, you know, if you remember the mind, you know, this, uh, this is the event, the event comes out and you react to the event, moving your muscles, and this is the mind. Another way to, this is, this energy pushing is the energy that pushes you. you if you perceive the energy of Shushuma, you call it love, or you call it Ananda, or you call it bliss, or Satchitananda, you call it that. You know, it's uh, the feeling of, unconditional love. Right. That's the energy that is pushing you. There is an energy that pushed you to walk, that pushed you to speak, right. that has been pushing you, that pushes you every morning to wake up and start your day. And that is pushing you, either you like it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is just pushing you and that's that energy, okay? So the mind, and this energy is life. So the, the mind could be interpreted also this is the energy there's only one energy like the light there's only one light which is white but then through the prism of the mind it becomes the uh, colors of emotions how do you call the the garco iris the 
Rainbow. 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 Oh, right. The rainbow of emotions, you know? So the pushing energy is the white light. So what this means is that you might fear dying, fear death, no? But what happens is there is the laugh, so you laugh life and then in the middle the mind tells you yes but you're going to die and you're going to suffer and you might go to hell and then it comes that love for life becomes fear of death right, yeah. Yeah. so it's the mind that creates the color that gives the color to the energy so the event is your boyfriend uh, told you that he's going to call at seven PM oh, yeah. and he hasn't called. Okay, that's the event. Uh, you're a young woman, an imaginary young woman. So uh, after half an hour you call the boyfriend, no answer. Telephone is switched off. You call again at eight, telephone switched off. At nine, telephone switched off. At ten, telephone switched off. 11, telephone switched off. 12, telephone switched off. You end up sleeping, and the following day, you call him. And the telephone is on, and he picks the phone. Th this is the event. And the behavior is the behavior in answer to that event, right? So that's the event. And this event produces two kinds of thoughts. Conscious thoughts, so thoughts that you are conscious of them, and what we could call subconscious patternings that condition that you have these conscious thoughts. In this example, this woman you know, different persons with different subconscious patternings would have different conscious thoughts. In this example, imaginary example, the main thoughts of this woman are my boyfriend doesn't love me. My boyfriend He's going to leave me. And my boyfriend is with another woman. These are the main thoughts that this woman is having. You picture it, is with another woman. Obviously, to have this kind of conscious thoughts, there must be certain subconscious patternings there and probably a feeling of inadequacy because you know if you feel not adequate for your boyfriend but you, are start, you, you, you start to think if he's adequate for you you would not have these kind of thoughts but you have probably feel, uh, patternings with feelings of inadequacy, insecurity you know there will be certain conditionings in these patternings that make you have these conscious thoughts. Now with these conscious thoughts, this is the energy of the love that this, the love that this woman has, the white light for this man. And after this, after going through this mind, it comes as an emotion. And the emotion here is jealousy, uh, anger, anger frustration, for example. So your emotion conditions your behavior, which is the movement of the muscles. And you call your boyfriend in the morning and you tell him. Imagine, you picture it. Okay look at the situation how it is it doesn't matter what the boyfriend was doing the boyfriend could uh, you know have met i always put this example because it's very graphical the boy could have met 
with an older girlfriend, you know, they went to have a coffee, one thing led to another, and they ended up having a relationship, probably it only meant that the boyfriend realized that that relationship was finished, but you know, the boyfriend could have gone uh, to a whorehouse, some men do. Uh, the boyfriend uh, could have been sacked from his job and he's walking around the town, he, did, he didn't want to speak with anybody, put the telephone off and he's walking all around the town thinking about what I'm going to do with my life. The boyfriend, you know, probably it could have happened, the mother called, look, your grandmother that has Alzheimer has disappeared, he has been all night searching for her, he ran out of batteries and he was all night looking for, or the boyfriend might have just forgotten about it and was with friends having uh, some beers and didn't realize that he had no battery. But after that call, your boyfriend loves you a little bit less. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> he was doing. After that call, your boyfriend even thinks about leaving you. Say, my God, I mean, this woman. <laughs> and after that call, and after that call, you know, your boyfriend starts thinking, maybe I need another kind of woman. If you repeat this enough number of times, your boyfriend leaves you, stops loving you, leaves you, and finds another woman. And that is how you make your thoughts real. Because you condi they condition your emotions and that's your behavior and you are going to make them reflect in the exterior without you knowing that you are doing that and without any magic involved. So be careful with what you think and what you believe to be true in your conscious thoughts. Because probably if you start questioning your thoughts. My boyfriend doesn't love me. Why? Because he has forgotten call, calling you? Right. And also, what is love? Because people say very quickly, you don't love me. But what do you mean when you say someone you don't love me? What do you mean? You, do you mean that you feel a warmth when I remember your name? Do you mean that I bring you flowers every Friday? What do you mean by that you don't love me? You don't even know what you are speaking about. Right. And you make it very important. <laughs> so, you know, be careful with your conscious thoughts and what you believe to be true in your conscious thoughts. And if your conscious thoughts are creating a belief that are generating a negative emotion, instead of being carried away by the negative emotion, Question your thoughts. What the hell are you believing that is producing this negative emotion? Is it true? Is my boyfriend the only fish in the ocean? You know? Uh, and if he's going to leave me, so what? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be able to, to not get carried away and believe your conscious thoughts. Conscious thoughts that generate negative emotions are just tricks of the mind. Like the one I did with the cards. <laughs> and the mind is very, very cunning animal and can do many, many tricks. So beware of the mind <laughs> and the tricks of the mind. No. Uh, so this basically, That's from a practical zero, point zero. of view, what, these, what does this mean? Well, can I just ask one question? So do you think that all these tricks are of the mind are due to that uh, basic animal instinct? Of yeah, yeah, the survival and, and perpetuation. Yeah, yeah, that, that the, 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 the little eye wants to survive and perpetuate itself. And so, ah, it's my, my boyfriend, it's me and mine, is. It, I cannot lose that. I, I, you need to perpetuate that right. thing which you are identified with and then you start believing all these things and you start having this emotion and you get carried away and what happens is that you, you're just suffering. I mean, that only brings right. suffering. 
in, 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 at the end of the day. The main teaching here is that when you are having thoughts that are producing you negative emotions, stressful emotions, the first thing you need to do is question those thoughts. Question the thoughts. Is it true what you are thinking? You know there are many techniques to question your thoughts. For example, Byron Katie, if you have heard about yeah, I was her. Yeah, just going to say, is it true? Is it really? Byron true? Katie has yeah. a good method. The, the four good. questions, and it's, yeah. I use that as an example in my courses because it's very graphical, you know, yeah. and uh, you know people can very quickly realize how it works. Mm -hmm. But question what you are believing to be true, because if you question well, you will be able to say no, not this. Not this, neti neti. You will always be able to discard the thought that is producing the negative emotion. And the emotion only disappears when you stop believing what you think. For example, Susie. Yes. If I go and tell you, Susie, careful. There is a cobra by your feet and you look and you see a cobra. What's the emotion that you will feel? <laughs> Fear, right? Fear, yes. And then I say, don't move, don't move, don't move. And then I start looking and I do like this and I take it and it's plastic and I say, oh, well, it's plastic. What happens with the fear? Gone. Gone immediately. The emotion disappears immediately when you realize the thought is false. false while you think that what you think is real, the emotion prevails, uh, persists. Like, for example, the problem my daughter has. She believes the most <laughs> incredible things and believes it to be true, and they are so incredible that, you know, she is yeah. under uh, complete stress and suffer and anxiety, uh, out of her own, but we all do the same, you know, we are all as, as nuts as the people that are in the asylums, you know, the only thing is that we are nuts in a normal way, so we <laughs> yeah. are accepted by society, and the people in the asylum, like my daughter, is, they are not like us, but in an abnormal way, and then you put them in an asylum but they are not different to us for that respect you know, in how the mechanisms work that's a question about the snake is that uh, even though she knows how it's plastic she, the fear is gone but she has that uh, trauma within her now no? it would create a trauma well not necessarily I mean uh, an experience can create a trauma you know these uh, hard experiences very hard experiences uh, create traumas. Uh, I don't know, typical uh, soldiers that go to war, right. and uh, you know, yeah. when you live a dramatic story, you know, what happens is that you get such a deep impression mm -hmm. that is difficult to believe that that is untrue, because the impression is so deep that you, you know, it's difficult to discard because, you know, it was so impressive to see all that blood and all, whatever the case might be, that, you know, you get uh, very impressed. But at the end of the day, it's the same mechanism. I mean, you have to eventually realize that, well, you are not the impression. You are not the impression. The impression is experience, but you are the experiencer of the experience. So, how do these patterns come about? And how does your circumstances come about? We go back to this mind scheme. So, this is the universal mind, and this is the material universe. 
So you see this is an A? Um <laughs> Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, Just joking. <laughs> uh, anyhow, you arrive, you know, and here we could say that they are current. So you arrive with predetermined tendencies. So it's like a current, you know? So say you are born, and I will put the example, say you are born uh, and you come with a tendency of complaining. You've been complaining for the last six lifetimes, and you have not sorted the situation. So you are a professional complainer. <laughs> and you have to sort that, that situation in this lifetime. So you come as a little baby and you are the typical baby that cries all the time because it's the way you have to complain when you are a baby. So it's not one of these babies that smiles all the time, it's, you know, a crying baby all the time. So you are born in a, uh, in a family with a mother which is overprotective, okay? That's one. In the same neighborhood, because birds of a feather flock together, <laughs> and it has to do with evolution, so you know if that is a pattern that has to be sorted, there will be other people around that are born with the same tendency. So this other baby is born a few weeks later in the same neighborhood, with the same tendency, you know, complainer, professional complainer, cries. But now this one is born into a family with a mother that cares nothing about it. You know, if, if, if she cries too much, she pushes the room, closes the door, and puts the things for the music, and that's it. So, same tendency, two different mothers. So, what happens? Uh, this, the, the one, the first one, you know, she listens, for example, a door banging and she gets scared and she cries. And then the mother comes and so she listens a door banging, she cries, moves the muscles, cries, the mother comes, all these things are recorded, you know? So I cry, I I'm taking care. Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. And then she's hungry a little bit, she feels hunger in the stomach, cries, the mother comes and feeds her. And that's one. The other one, you cry, no. nothing. Yeah. And you cry, no. nothing. It's the same tendency and it creates different kinds of impressions, different set of information. Now, when you are three years old, if they take you to the infant, infant, infant school? Yeah, preschool. 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 Pre pre they take you to preschool in that neighborhood, and then the, the woman in charge of the preschool is more like the second mother. So doesn't care too much about the crying of the people. So this girl, the, the first girl, gets there, starts to cry. The preschool is not her mommy and doesn't answer as her mommy, but this other girl recognizes, not consciously, but this works automatically, recognizes her same pattern. And she has developed over these three years of not being taken care of, the, she has been taking care of dolls and things, so she has been reversing, I am not taking care, so I take care of dolls. Okay. So that's very typical, any psychology is good. So uh, she has developed that, and then this girl becomes a friend of this girl and takes care of her in that situation which creates new patterns in the first girl. So, as your circumstances create patterns, you answer to those patterns, creating new circumstances that create new patterns that create new circumstances in a way that your patterns and your circumstances are exactly 
the same. Do you understand the concept? Mm. This, the way it works, another way of looking at this, is the following. But the second girl is changing. What do you mean the second girl is changing? <laughs> Second girl is like the first girl, but it, she has developed different patterns. You know, that girl becomes a friend of this girl, and they go in preschool together, and they make these other friends that create these other Im these other impressions, and then you go to school, and you know you continue complaining, you continue getting surrounded by people that help you when you complain. And at the end of the day, you are cre the, the outer circumstances is what created the impressions and the impressions and your answer to the outer circumstances created new circumstances, like in the example of mm -hmm. my boyfriend doesn't love me. So, you know, you are interacting. So it's a flower that grew together. Mm -hmm. Your circumstances and your impressions grew together, it, it, it's not like this goes by its way and this goes by its way, like not interrelated. They are completely interrelated. Right. Mm -hmm. so you understand like, that? Yeah, so like people will say, oh, she married her father or something like that. The circum maybe something like that, or you have friends that you have them for a certain reason because they relate to... Would you say similar? That's a similar situation. Well, the 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 end situation is the following: if you represent the mind in this other way, like an inverted cone, and this is the superficial consciousness, subconscious. This imagine this like a sea. The, the surface of the cone. These are the conscious thought, the conscious mind. You know where the waves. Mm -hmm. And here there are structures. A, structure B, structure C, structure D, so on and so forth. These structures have been created by these repetitions, like in the example and have created the structures of information. These structures are reflected in your circumstances because the structures that you have and the circumstances in which you live grew together. You know, it, they happened at the same time. At the same time that you will receive it, you were receiving impressions you were, you were responding to this impression, creating changes in the outside that created new impressions, and so it's an interdependency, an interrelated phenomena. Right. So, for example, look, let me put you practical examples of daylight. We, in Spain, we have this program for gender violence victims, women that are I suppose you have this problem in this country also, you know, mm -hmm. that they are killed or beaten or you name it. And this is a foundation that we work with that, you know, when a woman is in these circumstances, they have like floods and things like that, mm -hmm. and they are kept there while the judicial yeah. case yeah. goes on and, you know, all the things. And then there are social workers and psychologists and all the support, you know, things that are required for these things. And we teach them meditation amongst the other services that they receive. But what every social worker will tell you, and I have seen it myself many times, is this is the, the guy that is treating you badly, right? So you, you put him out through a court order. You know, you cannot be two miles from you have to be mm -hmm. away to my son. Some of them get this GPS thing to it's have them under control. Mm -hmm. No? And you take that away. Good. But the day, the, 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 you know, and you have her in the flat and she is there. 
and you know the, the first day she doesn't leave the flat she feels more comfortable and leaves the flat and gets with another guy in a bar that night which mm -hmm. is the same right yeah. exactly. which is the same and i've seen that so many yes. times that is exactly. because yep. if you don't change the structure you know this is like gravity this creates a signal an energy right, exactly. of some description that you go exactly to that bar where that guy is and that intuition is only the laws of nature operating right. mm -hmm. that fact that you go to that bar to see that guy are just the laws of nature operating mm -hmm. and you go to that bar to see that guy and you you like him and he's another how do you call the guys that he treat women maltratador they say Abuser. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You meet another abuser. Right. Yeah. So, your circumstances and the patterns by which you know your circumstances, because remember, you know your circumstances and your world and your reality because of the previous impressions. But those previous impressions are these structures. So, the only thing is that you are looking yourself in the mirror in the circumstances. So, if you hate your circumstances, you are hating yourself. Mm -hmm. Remember this. Because your circumstances and the patterns through which you know this universe are exactly a specular image one of each other. So, in reality, Either you see God, or you see yourself. So if it comes to the point that you go beyond, you transcend your patterns, then you see the whole picture, and you know what, what you see is the divine, the divine manifestation. Mm -hmm. But if not, you are seeing yourself, so never quarrel with your circumstances because it's you. Treat them as if it was you. When we say love your neighbor as thyself, it's because your neighbor and everything is your neighbor, including the shoes or the chair, is just you. So you have to love him as if it was you, because it is you, in fact. Not happy with what they say? <laughs> Uh, time for a coffee? Si. We've been for like an hour and a half now. Okay. Oh, I never heard that before. What? what? Uh, love thy neighbor as thyself and to treat everything as you It's you again. Like things.